Hello, and blessings to all of our PG listeners and others who tune in to our Sunday School lesson. This is Lesson 7 out of Unit 2, Call to Ministry, and the title for our lesson is Remembering Good Deeds. Our devotional reading is from the book of Acts, the second chapter, verses 29 through 39. Our background scripture is the same as our printed passage. It's Matthew, the 26th chapter, verses 1 through 13. <clears throat> and our key verse, and I'm reading from the NIV, is Matthew, the 26th chapter, and the 13th verse. And it reads, Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Our lesson's aims are to contrast the love of the woman with the disciples' response to her actions, appreciate the woman's preparation of Jesus for his coming death and burial, embrace the call to proclaim the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, despite ridicule or resistance. So our lesson from our printed passage, the Faith Pathway Study Manual, is broken down into three categories. And the first category is titled as The Plot. And then the second category is the poor, and then the last category is the poor. So we're going to address the three different categories of our lesson and then uh, lift from the lesson what scripture is actually saying to us in reference to our printed text. So we're going to begin by first acknowledging the uh, plot, the beginning first five verses of our lesson. Now in the first five verses, it starts off by saying, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples. Now, as we look through the book of Matthew, uh, we are nearing the end uh, as our lesson is in the 26th chapter. And we learned that prior to this setting, uh, Jesus had just finished uh, teaching about the ten virgins and the parable of the talents and the separation of the sheep and the goats uh, the judgment that was before them. Uh, plus, we know that prior to this time that Jesus had performed many miracles. Uh, Christ had already raised the dead. He had, Christ had already healed the sick. He had given sight to the blind. He had caused the lame to walk. Uh, he had fed the 5,000 with the fish and the loaves of bread. So uh, Christ had, in addition to his masterful ability to teach and to get a lesson across to explain profound teachings and proverbial sayings, he was able to lift from those different arts of teaching. He was able to lift the pertinent, significant, needful information in such a way that it astounded the multitudes that heard it. Even the chief priest and the so-called during that day masterful uh, teachers and 
the greatest of the great in terms of their understanding of the law and its practice as well as its implications and applications. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, he astounded all that heard him. And this was from his inception as we find that uh, when Joseph and Mary thought that they had lost Christ as they were uh, journeying from the uh, Passover, when they found that when they were uh, doing their pilgrimage, they looked around to notice that Christ was missing. And where did they find him? They found him in the synagogue with the Jewish teachers of that day who were also at the age of 12. He was astounding them then by the questions that he proposed and also the insights, the insightful wording that he responded to, the things that already had perplexed uh, and confused the teachers of that day. So we know that Christ was a masterful teacher, but here he's lifting other concerns to the disciples. And so the plot here is, is that it's just a couple of days uh, in Matthew, we find it's a couple of days uh, prior to the Passover. And I think in the 12th chapter of John, John says it was six days, I believe, before the Passover, but um, it's near Christ's end. It's near his time to be sacrificed upon the cross. And uh, he is trying to prepare his disciples uh, once again uh, to get them mentally and spiritually ready for what is about to take place. And we learn here that the chief priests and the elders, so the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, uh, those uh, who uh, have been placed in a position uh, with the responsibility of recognizing the Messiah and having a receptive and a welcoming spirit. But because of their place, and because of the man-made authority that had been given unto them, and because they had become accustomed to this position and status, it blinded them to the point that they could not recognize the Savior when they saw him. Because of their position, their status, their, their spirit of comfort and complacency with where they were. And these things blinded them to the reality which was before them. To the point that they were willing to conspire and they wanted to take his life. But they feared the people, the multitudes. Isn't it strange how people with considered by those of the status quo, but people in the masses, in the multitudes, who are not considered to be as knowledgeable and their intellect is not to the degree of those in these established positions of authority and such. But isn't it something how those that are considered not as learned are, have, they have the ability to recognize spirit when it's present. They are not blinded by their credentials or their status, 
or, or they are not, shall we say, they are not linked to those institutions that support those positions. But they recognize when the presence of God is among them. But for some strange reason, those who we are told have received the schooling, the training, the knowledge, the learning, the insight, and have been prepared to recognize the presence of God when it is before us, they don't see it. But those that are considered to be unlearned, they recognize it right away. But anyway, uh, in our lesson, uh, we learned through the first section of it in the plot that the people, because they were in mass and there were many gathered around Christ, because of this, the people's presence caused a hindrance. It, it created a scenario for those who wanted to take his life by force. Many times scriptures, uh, scripture tells us that they were in certain settings and they wanted to stone him to death like he was just a common criminal and he was due death by, by the uh, force of stoning. So many times they plotted because they saw him as a threat to their position, status, and to their common wealth that they had ob obtained by being placed in those uh, positions of authority. They saw Christ as a threat to that and they were not willing to give it up, even though they realized themselves and from the response of the people that Christ was not just a prophet, not just an ordinary teacher or man among the people. But they were willing to forego that and take that life out so that they could maintain the status quo. So Christ here is trying to alert the disciples of what is about to take place, which leads us into part two, the poor. And uh, this is in the process of the uh, action. So uh, this is not in our last section of the poor identifying a uh, economic status of uh, people, but this is in the process of the action of a person, a woman, who poured out of a very expensive box referred to as the alabaster box and uh, expensive oils. So when we look at this here, uh, we realize that there was uh, an uh, indignation, as uh, the scripture uh, uh, words it, that the disciples were very indignant about this situation. Um, now, in Matthew, it identifies the person as a woman, but in John, John tells us that this was Mary. Uh, the sister of Martha, and also the sister of Lazarus. And we know the story of how Christ raised Lazarus from the dead. And uh, we also realize that at this dinner, Lazarus was also present. Uh, if we read the 12th chapter of John and read down to... Uh, or I think it's around about the ninth verse, we find out that they not only, and speaking of the chief, chief priests and the elders and such, they not only wanted to kill Christ, but they also wanted to kill the works of Christ. They wanted to kill Lazarus also 
because Lazarus' presence proved to the people that Christ had the power to resurrect the dead, that Christ was the resurrection. And so they not only feared Christ, his presence, his teachings, his wonders, his works, but they also wanted to kill whatever accomplishments that he made. And Lazarus was a clear example he didn't have to say anything. All he had to do was just be present. He could just go to the market. He could just go to the seashore where the fishermen were. He could just go by the temple. He didn't have to go in it. He could just go by it. And as the people on the outside, those going in, those coming out, seeing him reminded them that that's the dead man that Christ raised from the grave, who had already been in the grave past three days. And so uh, if we read in the 12th chapter of John, as I say, I think it's down around about the ninth verse, but we read into there, we find that they also, the chief priests, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the elders and such, they also wanted to kill Lazarus, but at the same time, they feared the multitude and feared that if they did kill Lazarus, it would evoke a riot. So, but now let's look at the disciples here uh, as Mary took from the alabaster box some very expensive oil. And here's something that we should really zero in on. And that is the response of the disciples. Now, in the fourth chapter of John, uh, when Christ was speaking to the woman at the well, uh, if we read further into that, uh, we find out that when the disciples saw him speaking to the woman at the well, uh, the scripture says they marveled at the fact that he was talking to a woman. Now we know she was a Samaritan woman, but the scripture says that they marveled at this. Uh, and we read in the uh, other gospels that uh, it says that they murmured meaning they were mumbling among themselves. They wouldn't directly uh, uh, approach Christ uh, and question his motive for what he was doing, but among themselves, they murmured one to another, uh, giving sign that even though they were with Christ, even though they had witnessed the power that Christ possessed, that he was able to do what no other man, just a natural man could do. He was able to do what no other prophet or teacher or rabbi or priest could do. That he exemplified that he had a power from the heavens, that he possessed the spirit of God. And even though uh, everything that they were exposed to it was freely given to them that even the fact that they were chosen by Christ to be his disciples, uh, they didn't have to pay a membership fee to become one of his disciples. Um, uh, the, all of that teaching and, the, and that inner circle camaraderie that, that was afforded to them, that the, the fact that Christ was kind, uh, that Christ was courteous, that Christ was considerate and loving toward women, it did not decrease or negate any of the attention that he gave to the disciples. Yet, the disciples were indignant about the fact that this woman had taken 
a prized possession. Now, now th there should be some uh, some uh, credit uh, given to the woman, because as we know through Scripture, uh, women then, women now, were treated as second-class citizens. Uh, we could even make the association that uh, they were treated like stepchildren, not, not full heirs uh, to the wealth of the day, but whatever is left over they could have. Uh, and that was only if they were married to the person who had the wealth. Uh, so we recognize that uh, women were treated in an ill form uh, as though they were not equal. But, but just so that we understand the value of women, and apparently this is what Christ understood, was if we just read Proverbs, the 31st chapter, the last chapter of Proverbs, we find out that uh, women uh, had uh, a list of abilities, that, that women were, were resourceful, that, that women were, they were uh, like, um, they were insightful, uh, they, they were wise, uh, they were kind, uh, they, they understood investments, they knew uh, what was a good bargain, they possessed or they purchased land because they recognized value when they saw it. Uh, it goes on and it talks about that they were seamstress, that they, they made clothing and linen and they took care of their household. They were concerned about those that were needy. Uh, they always had a way of providing for their inner family, but knowing how to have enough to provide for those who served them. So they weren't high and pious. Uh, it talks about how their speech was, was with integrity, that, that they were genuine. That, so, so there was, uh, on one hand, we see that women were, they were blessed of God. Uh, we many times highlight uh, the different characteristics of men in Scripture. But as God is no respect of person, and as God, male and female, created he them, uh, we recognize that he did not leave the women void of inequalities or characteristics, but some kind of way it crept into the mind of the disciples that uh, this woman has gone uh, overboard. She's, uh, she's uh, stepped uh, beyond the uh, parameters that we've placed on her. Now, now why, why is she wasting uh, this perfume? Uh, on Christ, pouring it on his head and then anointing his body and then uh, giving this very ceremonial uh, uh, presence or washing his feet with her hair. And who is she trying to impress? Why didn't you take that and use it uh, for something that would have been more needful? Why didn't you take that and uh, use that to give to the poor? And that brings us into the last section of our lesson, the poor. And here we find uh, that Christ says, uh, uh, when Jesus understood what they were saying, uh, he said, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. And then he identifies and recognizes for them, the poor you will always have, but you will not always have me. What she has done 
is the perfume, the oil that she's anointed me with is a sign of preparation, preparing me for my burial. What I was trying to tell you all back in verse 1 through 5, but uh, I see that the act of that personified what I was explaining to you earlier on, you still didn't recognize it. You allow the ways of the world again to cloud your vision and you also allowed it to create a certain disposition and an attitude to emerge from you that should have been removed by now sense of all the teachings and all the exposure and all of the masterful parables that I've brought before you. But yet, you still didn't recognize it. But this I will leave with you. I'll tell you this, that wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what Mary has done will also be told. In memory of her. Now, we learn that in John, uh, the person who actually raised the question here was the same person that portrayed Christ. I'm sorry, betrayed Christ. I said portrayed. <laughs> but the same person that betrayed Christ is the person who raises the question, and the disciples agree with it, that uh, what are you doing? Wasting that good oil when we could have used that money. Now, if we read also Judas, he was money hungry. And if we read over in, again, the 12th chapter of John, I believe at the 6th verse, it talks about some of Judas's actions because it said he kept the money box. You sometimes have to watch these people that keep the money box. Because sometimes uh, we always try to choose people of good character. Uh, people with, you know, integrity. People that have all of their wits. Uh, sometimes our selection is incorrect. But Judas, the betrayer, he was the one who kept the money box. And it says in, in the 12th chapter of John, I believe it's the 6th verse, uh, it says about that he sometimes took what was in the money box. He was a thief, but he was keeping the money box. <laughs> sometimes we have to watch the people that are watching over the money. But uh, so we recognize here that uh, what uh, Judas was looking at was is that this might have been another opportunity for him to acquire some money that he himself didn't develop. That that money could have been sold, uh, you could have given that to me, I'd have put it in the money box, and you can be certain I would have distributed it among the poor. But instead, you wasted it on the head of Christ and on his feet. So, uh, when we think about this, uh, it gives us some insight into. Now, here Christ is trying to prepare people for his departure. And look at the different attitudes and the different characteristics that are displayed. So, we hope that something was said to lift our awareness and understanding of what Matthew the 26th uh, verses 1 through 13, uh, what they were actually dispelling to us or revealing to us. And as always, our prayer is that the blessings of God will always be upon you and his peace and understanding dwell within you. God bless you and God keep you.